Good morning, Long Beach friends. This is the recording from May 8th, which is actually Mother's Day. So it's kind of part of the John series, but kind of not. It, it will use some passages from John, but it isn't exactly in the series. We'll count it as in the series for the sake of the podcast and so on, but so it is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we pray that on this Mother's Day, we would be a blessing to mothers, women who raise children who follow Jesus. We know this is not just a biological thing. It's, a, it's, it's what you call all of us to, uh, men as fathers, women as mothers, making more children of God. And we know that's not something we do all on our own. It's not something where we're even the prime movers. It's something that you do. But you, you give us the privilege of participating with you, and we want to bless those who've been mothers, biological mothers, spiritual mothers, sisters, uh, aunts and uncle, aunts and aunts and grandmothers. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for all the, the, the women that we celebrate today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this series, we're focusing on what God is like. And today we're going to focus on what he's like through mothers and some good examples, not some not so good examples. And, and our, our thought is, the Rick Watts thought, to know God means to look at, like Him and live in a way that reflects His character. And today, it's to live in a way that reflects His character as mothers. That's what we're going to focus on. I'm going to consider three mothers from the New Testament today. Um, the mothers are Mary, Jesus' mother, surprise. I'm going to consider the mother of James and John, also known as the sons of Zebedee or the sons of Thunder. And Herodias, the mother of Salome one of the Salome's in Scripture. Now, you know the story of Mary, right? An angel appears to her, says, you're going you're gonna to have a child, right? He is going to be named Jesus, and, and, and all the stuff that we always read about at Christmas. And how does Mary respond, right? Luke 1, she says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Good start there. We keep reading about how Mary thought about this one that the angel told her about, this Jesus, right? Uh, all the stuff happens with the shepherds and, and them come at finding Jesus and angels singing. And Luke tells us, Mary treasured up these things, all these things, and pondered them in her heart. What is this about? She's thinking, what is my son's life going to be? Very motherly, huh? And then... Um, a little later, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about them, about him, right? Um, after they meet with, with Simeon and Aunt Anna in the temple as Jesus is being uh, given his name and, and circumcised, right? When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. A little while later, Luke tells us about a time when they're around the age of 12, kind of the age of the bar mitzvah celebration, son of the law. Uh, and they go to Jerusalem for the festival, and they, they, they're, they're in a big gathering of people, and, and Jesus is old enough not to just be, you know, holding his mom's hand while they walk. And they realize they don't have him. And they've walked away from Jerusalem, and he's not with the group going back to Nazareth. So they go back, and they search for him, and they found, find him in the temple. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Right? There, there's an example of how Mary and Joseph are not quite getting what is Jesus about. They're not quite tuned in to what God is doing with him in that encounter Jesus had with the, the, the teachers of the law in the temple. And they're thinking he's going to be more like what they're expecting. But it's not a problem. It's just how it was. 
Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother, again, treasured all these things in her heart. What does all this mean? And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. That's all we know, pretty much, of Jesus growing up. All right, that's about it. And, and, and we jump into John, which we studied a few weeks ago. Uh, in John chapter 2, it starts out with the, the wedding feast in Cana, not too far from Nazareth, as far we believe. And, and Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, they have no more wine. And Jesus says, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Another example, Mary has thoughts about what Jesus could do to make this situation better. I know what Jesus should do. And, and it involves him doing this miracle in a way that is not really in tune with God's plan and the timing. And, and Jesus responds kind of roughly to her. You're not with the program. He doesn't even call her mom. That's a little harsh, it seems. My hour has not yet come. How does Mary respond to this, I don't know whether I should say conflict, maybe I should say contrast with her expectations or her, her desires. She says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. She trusts him. She trusts Jesus to know what his father's business is. Now she has her own thoughts. She has her own desires. She has her own inclinations. But she brings them all under God. She even allows Jesus to grow up. Do whatever he tells you. May it be to me as you have said, she says about herself with God. Do whatever he tells you. He says, when Jesus says, it's not time for that. Great example, Mary. We'll mention her again in just a minute. Now I want to turn to the really bad example, <laughs> the really poor example, Herodias. Um, I started out thinking she's a bad example as a mother. And I started, and, and, and honestly, by the time I finished rereading the scripture passages, I kind of, I felt bad for her. She's the daughter of a man called Aristobulus IV and his wife, Berenice. Uh, her grandfather was Herod the Great, you know, the guy who tried to kill Jesus as a baby when he was born and the wise men or the, the magi came to see him. And he ended up killing a bunch of infant boys near Bethlehem instead. Herod, her grandfather, even killed her father, Aristobulus, had him assassinated because he thought he was a threat to his rule. That was Herodias' growing up. So she had some very bad examples in her past. And now she's living out the life of a first century aristocratic Middle Eastern ruler kind of person, playing fast and loose with any ethics that we might recognize. It's all about her because that's what she's learned. She has left her first husband to marry Herod Antipas. her uncle. Why? Well, it's unclear. Maybe she loved him. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. She was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. He's going to impress all his important friends on his birthday party. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. This probably was not just a polite little dance, if you get my drift. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, ask whatever you, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Drunk guy trying to impress his friends. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Herodias, her mother, says, the head of John the Baptist. At once, 
The girl hurried in to the king with a request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on the platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother, Herodias. That's Herodias' story. It ends so in this section with her demanding John the baptizer's head on a plate, and she got it. Through her, her manipulation of her husband's pride and sexuality through her dancing daughter. I think there's a couple things to observe here. First, Herodias is a clear example of following the ways of the flesh as a mother. But I think we should take a more powerful example from her life and actions. She learned that way of thinking somewhere. She saw it around her. She picked it up. It didn't necessarily come out of a book or a teacher saying, do it this way or that way. It's what she saw. It's what she saw her grandfather do. It's what she saw her father do. It's what she saw her husband, her, her aunts and uncles, the people around her. She learned a way of living, and it was awful. Clearly, the parenting, the mothering that influenced her did not turn out someone living to carry the image of God. Every evil person has a story. Our evils are rarely only our own. Her very unwise and even evil mothering of Salome, her daughter, is not just a story of how not to mother. It's an example of how the evil of this world winds its way through the generations, corrupting children who then have children. And Herodias as a child was corrupted, and Herodias as a mother corrupted her child Salome. What a sad, sad testimony. I'm going to turn to the third mother. The last is the mother of James and John. We're not sure of her name, although some people read Scripture in a way that lets them find out that her name was Salome. Maybe they're right. It's another Salome, not Herodias' daughter. Salome is apparently, as a name, based on the Hebrew word for peace that we know as shalom. Not exactly representative of Herodias' daughter, but here we're talking about the mother of James and John. We have a story about her from Matthew chapter 20, starting verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, came to Jesus with her sons, James and John, and kneeling down, ask a favor of him, Jesus. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to her, to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, well, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Well, whatever her name was, she was naturally inclined to want high positions or accomplishments for her sons. She believed Jesus was going to establish a new government in his new kingdom, and so she wants her sons to have the highest place on the right and the next highest place on the left, be beside him, left and right. And Jesus gives them a response that's not exactly positive, right? They will drink from his cup, but they're not going to sit in a place of power and rule in a dominating kingdom like she's expecting. And you know what? They all, corrected now, probably not really understanding yet, they continued to follow Jesus. We believe that James and John's mother was with the women who were watching Jesus be crucified. Matthew tells us, chapter 27, Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Zebedee's sons are James and John. While she was there, she would have witnessed something. She would have witnessed Jesus on the cross, caring for Mary, his mother. John tells us, chapter 19, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, 
his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Jesus, being crucified, knows he's really coming into his kingdom. That is his, his coronation. But it's not going to be a human kingdom. It's not going to form a new government. He's not going to be bodily present for more than 40 days after his resurrection. And he knows the, the world he lives in. And he calls one of his disciples and says, I want you to take care of my mother. Something much bigger than James and John's mother was thinking, and James and John was thinking, were thinking, was happening. And soon there was a resurrection. Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 15, he's kind of summarizing. He says, what I received I passed on to you is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. I wonder, did Jesus appear to his mother, Mary? I'd like to think so, but I don't see this recorded in Scripture, so maybe he did and maybe he didn't. I like to think so. What about James and John? Well, yes, he did appear to the twelve. They saw him. Their mother? Did she see him? We don't know. Who knows? Who was among those 500 that Paul reports? We just don't know. What we do know is that Jesus did not leave his mother with no care. This new kingdom that he's beginning, this new life, is not a life that leaves behind all regard for what, 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 what we know before. It's a life that changes the way we interact with this created world. We, we, we care. We carry the image of God. We act in love, and Jesus acts in love for his mother, knowing he will not physically be there to care for her, and he calls this other disciple to care for her. And he established his kingdom that will last forever, he didn't lead James and John in a war with the Romans, but he did establish his kingdom, testifying by his spirit and calling us today to celebrate that God created families, male and female. God says, be fruitful and multiply, raise children. He's called mothers to be mothers, like Mary, for which we're grateful. Mary's example is very powerful. Being a mother in the kingdom of God can be painful, as she found, but it's good, and great good comes from good mothers who, like Mary, say, may it be to me, as you have said, and to their children, setting aside their own desires and hopes, do whatever he tells you. In this time of pandemic changes and all the confusion we're facing and the craziness out there in this world, being a good mother, being good families, caring for our mothers, caring for our children, it's so important. Being a person who makes people who follow Jesus, that's what disciples are. That's something that we're called to do, male and female, and we like to celebrate all the spiritual mothers that we have in our, in our, in our church, in our body. It's been such a blessing to see the way that both the, 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 the women in our church are good spiritual mothers and the men in our church are good spiritual fathers. And we'll talk about them on Father's Day. I don't want to completely leave them out. But today's the day to celebrate mothers with a Jesus life focus. And so that's what I encourage you to do in the rest of today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you've given us families, that you've established a way for us to, to, to form um, new life, new biological life and new spiritual life and that you've called us to be mothers and fathers, whether it's biological, spiritual, or just, just caring for people who need to know what it's like to follow Jesus, encouraging them, helping them to 
find their way in this world according to Jesus' kingdom, according to his purpose for them. And we pray for all of our children as mothers and fathers. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he says where he is God. And for us, may it be to us as you have said. In Jesus' name, amen.